Hello, my name's Dr Amanda Waterman and I'm a developmental psychologist at the Institute of Psychological Sciences at the University of Leeds. And this podcast, we're going to be talking about some theories of development, of cognitive development. First of all, we're going to be looking at Piaget and then we're going to have a little look at Vygotsky. And at the end, we're going to look at some theories of memory development. So Piaget had a cognitive developmental stage theory where he believed that children went through different stages and we'll look at that in more detail in a minute. Vygotsky unfortunately died at the age of 37 before he had time to complete much of his theory but he introduced something extra into our ideas of cognitive development and that was the idea of the social environment. So first of all we're going to be looking at Piaget. Piaget believed that children actively construct knowledge through their interaction with the environment. So it's very important for the child to be interacting with the environment in order to construct knowledge about the world. And Piaget said that children do this through the use of schemes. Schemes are organised ways of understanding the world and as the child interacts with the world these schemes develop and they improve with age. Initially Piaget believed that these schemes were action based. That is, it was to do with the child's physical interaction with the environment. And then as the child gets older this changes to mental interaction with the environment as they're able to mentally represent the world around them. So what about these schemes? Piaget believed that they developed through two key processes, assimilation and accommodation. Assimilation was when children use their current schemes to incorporate information that they encounter in the world. So if a child discovers a new object and that object is sufficiently similar to objects that they've already encountered, then they can include the information about that object into their existing schemes. This means that the child's schemes are in a state of equilibrium, there is no challenge to the schemes, the information that they've encountered is sufficiently similar that they can incorporate it into what they already know. Accommodation is when the object that the child encounters or the information that the child encounters is actually sufficiently different from the pre-existing schemes that the child actually has to adjust the scheme itself. And this is when they accommodate their scheme to better fit that knowledge which they're encountering in the world around them. This is the thing that creates a disequilibrium in the schemes. So because the new information doesn't fit into the scheme, it's a disequilibrium and that encourages the child to accommodate their new scheme. And this process of assimilation and accommodation keeps going on until the child's schemes become more and more complex. One of the key things to do with Piaget's theory is the idea of stages. Piaget believed that children go through stages of development and we'll talk about that again in a little more detail in a minute. But first of all, there are three things I'd like to tell you about stages that are very important to understand. The first is that Piaget thought that stages were universal. That is, he believed that they applied across all cultures around the world and that there was no difference depending on what culture you grew up in. The second is that Piaget thought that the stages were invariant. That is, that you go through the stages in the same order. You start at stage one, to stage two, to stage three, to stage four, and there's no jumping around between the stages. The third thing is that Piaget's stages imply a discontinuous model of development. Now, what do we mean by discontinuous? Well, this slide helps us to see what that means. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see the idea of development being a very gradual change as you go from birth to adulthood. So all the skills or the rudimentary building blocks of those skills are present at birth or in infancy and you just get slightly better at them as you go through life. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see that there are jumps and Piaget believed that you couldn't do something and then you got to a certain stage of development and then you could do something. So there is a qualitative shift as you're going through life. So baby can do certain things in the first stage and then there's a big jump up to the next stage and that's called a discontinuous development theory. So Piaget split development into four stages. The sensory motor stage from birth to two years, the pre-operational stage from two to seven, the concrete operational stage from seven to eleven and the formal operational stage from eleven up. And we will now look at each of those stages in turn. The sensory motor stage from birth to two years is all about building schemas through sensory experience and physical interaction with the environment. Piaget actually divided this stage into six more complicated substages, which we're not going to go into detail today. But I do just want to talk to you about some important milestones that are achieved during this stage. 
The first one is object permanence. The idea that children or babies begin to understand that an object continues to exist even when they can't see it. And Piaget came to this conclusion through experiments with children where he would give them a toy to play with, they would be sat down and there would be a toy put in front of them, and then after a while they would put a cover between the baby and the toy so that the baby could no longer see the toy. Babies under the age of about eight months act as if there was never a toy there in the first place. They completely lose interest and they show no interest in trying to find the toy. Once a baby is beyond the age of about 12 months, however, once you put the screen down, the baby will look for the toy, it will try to peer around the screen, it will grab the screen to try and get it out of the way to get to the toy. And Piaget said that's because at the age of 8 to 12 months, babies suddenly realise that just because they can't see something, it doesn't mean that thing ceases to exist, and they have understood that objects are permanent entities. Another important milestone in the sensory motor stage is mental representation. Object permanence is the building block of this. Mental representation, however, takes this on, and it is the basis for things like role play and pretend play, where the children actually are able to internalise mental representations of the world around them and hold those in their heads. And this is also one of the building blocks for memory. You have to be able to hold something in your head in order to be able to remember it. The next stage is the pre-operational stage, and in many ways this stage is characterised by what the child is not able to do. One of those limitations is known as egocentrism, and Piaget came to the conclusion that children at this age are egocentric by use of his experiment called the Three Mountains Task. And in the picture here you can see there's a little girl that's been brought into a room, and on the table in front of her are three mountains of differing heights with different things on the top. And the task that children were asked to do was to pick a picture that represented how they saw the scene. But then the children were asked to pick a picture to show how the doll sees the scene. You can see there's a little doll behind uh, the biggest mountain on the table. Now here, the child should pick a picture that is different from how they see the scene because the doll is looking at it from a different perspective. However, children between the ages of two and seven would pick the picture that showed how they saw it, not how the doll was seeing it. And this led Piaget to say that children at this age are unable to understand that different people see the world in a way that is different from them. Another famous Piagetian task is the inability to conserve. And here you can see there are some jars with some liquid in them. And the child would be brought into a room and they would be asked to make sure that beaker A and beaker B were the same size and to confirm that they had the same amount of liquid in them. And if the child wasn't sure, they would change the levels of the liquid until the child was absolutely sure that beaker A and beaker B had the same amount. The adult would then take beaker B and would pour, in full view of the child, all of the liquid into beaker C, which, as you can see, is a different shape. The adult has to make sure that none of the liquid is spilled, otherwise the experiment is spoiled. And then they say to the child, is there still the same amount of liquid in beaker A and beaker C? And children in the pre-operational stage will say no. And they will tend to say that there's more liquid in beaker C because beaker C is taller. And what children are failing to do is they're failing to understand that because no liquid was spilled, there has to be the same amount of liquid in beaker C. And they focus on one physical aspect of the beaker, that it's taller, and think therefore that there's more liquid in it. And they fail to take account of the fact that that beaker is actually also narrower. So when we move to the concrete operational stage, this is characterised by the fact that children can now pass a lot of the tasks that they were originally unable to do. So they are now able to conserve, they're able to classify and categorise various things, and they're also able to engage in spatial reasoning, so they're able to start using things like maps. However, their main limitation is they're still engaging in concrete thought. They're unable to think in an abstract, scientific way. And it's not until we reach the formal operational stage, from about the age of 11 years, that Piaget believed that children could actually engage in scientific, hypothetical reasoning. If you'd like to pause the podcast at this point and have a discussion about a couple of things, then this would be the opportunity to do so now. And what I'm suggesting you might want to talk about is what influences on education do you think Piagetian theory had? What sorts of things would you implement in the classroom based on what Piaget says about cognitive development? And secondly... Thinking about the Three Mountains task and the conservation of liquid task, can you think of anything that might be difficult for children, regardless of whether they are egocentric or able to conserve, about those particular experiments?
So looking at influence on education, there are two key things that came out of Piagetian theory. And the main one, I would suggest, is that children have to be active learners. It's very important that children interact with their environment in order, in order for them to be able to develop. So rather than just sitting at a desk and the teacher talking at them the whole time, it's important to be there, stuck into the sandpit, in the role play area, and interacting with all the things around them in order to construct their knowledge. There's also an aspect of Piagetian theory that impacts on education, that is the readiness of the child. As you might remember, we talked about the fact that Piaget thought children progressed in stages and that there was a qualitative shift between each stage, such that what the child was able to do in one stage was different from what they were able to do in another stage. Which means that Piaget thought that there were times in a child's life when they simply were not ready for certain types of information or education. So, for example, if one were to be a strict Piagetian, you would not really try to teach children very much abstract hypothetical scientific thought until they reach the age of 11, because they're simply not able to engage in that kind of thought. It was a bit more difficult maybe to think about the problems of the Piagetian experiments, but what lots of people have said post-Piaget is that some of the experiments are actually very difficult for children to understand. They don't really make sense to the child. So the idea of coming into a room and looking at three mountains of differing heights is not a particularly child-friendly task and perhaps not something that the child is very familiar with. And in a very nice experiment in 1975, Helen Bork tried to do this sort of experiment but made it much more child-friendly. And in this experiment, she brought children into a room and on the table was um, a model town. And in the model town was a little toy car with Grover from Sesame Street sat in the car. And then she would tell a story to the children where she drove Grover around the town because he had to stop off at different points. And then each time he stopped off, she asked the children, what can Grover see from his car? And when the task was made much more child-friendly, she found that children as young as four or five were actually able to show correctly what Grover could see from his car. If we look at the conservation of liquid task, one of the other problems that children sometimes have is really understanding why adults are asking the sorts of questions they're asking. So in the conservation of liquid task, an adult gets a child to confirm that there's the same amount of liquid in two beakers, then they do something, and then they ask exactly the same question again. Is there the same amount of liquid in these two beakers? And one of the problems for children is that sometimes they think, if an adult asks them exactly the same question again, that they need to change their answer, just because why else would the adult ask them the question if the adult didn't want a different response? So again, in some follow-up work, some people have done it in a way that makes more sense to the child. So there's a naughty teddy who damages one of the beakers. So they have to pour the water into a different beaker, and the only beaker they can find is one that's a slightly different shape. And then it makes sense to say to the child, so is there still the same amount of liquid in the two beakers now that we've got rid of the one that's damaged by the naughty teddy? And again, children as young as four or five are now able to say, yes, there's still the same amount of liquid. However, it's important to note that there is still a developmental trend. Three-year-olds will still not pass the more child-friendly tasks, and not all four- and five-year-olds will pass the tasks, where by the time that children are seven or eight, they will be passing them. So people still think that Piaget was correct in that there is a developmental trend, but that he may have underestimated children's abilities and that they may be able to solve these problems at a slightly earlier age if given a more appropriate task. So we've looked at Piaget, and now we're just going to briefly look at Vygotsky. As I said, unfortunately, Vygotsky died at the age of 37, so he wasn't able to develop his theories in the same way that Piaget did. But the key thing that Vygotsky brought to us was the idea that although he agreed with Piaget that knowledge was constructed through interacting with the world, he said that this was also through social interaction with our peers. So he introduced the idea that the social world of the child is just as important. And there are two key concepts to come from this, and one is called the zone of proximal development. Now, this is a slightly fancy phrase for something that is actually not that difficult. So if you think of a six-year-old child, they should, without any help, if they're a normally developing child, be able to count to ten without any help at all. However, even if you gave them all the help in the world, a six-year-old is unlikely to be able to solve a quadratic equation. And neither of these two situations are particularly those situations where you're going to learn the most. One is just very easy and you're not really learning anything, and the one is sufficiently difficult that you're not learning anything either. Vygotsky said we have to focus where we want to teach children at the zone of proximal development, which is things that they can achieve with a little bit of help. So they couldn't do it on their own, but if you give them some help, they can do it. And this is what he called the zone of proximal development. So it's important that adults and sometimes older peers help children and guide them in this particular zone where there are tasks that they can't do on their own but they can do with help.
and another key term is scaffolding and this is the help that those adults and older peers provide to the child and sometimes it might only need to be a little bit of help and sometimes it might need to be a lot of help so you have to adjust the amount of support you give the children through this scaffolding. Influence on education, well we've only very briefly looked at Vygotsky so I'm just going to talk now about a, a couple of things that he has introduced into the classroom and the obvious one is of course that we're looking now for those sorts of things that children can do with a bit of help and the importance of guided learning, being guided by the adult, by the teacher. But another thing one could argue that Vygotsky brought to the classroom and that is used in schools sometimes now is the idea that older peers can also help younger children to achieve certain tasks. If they themselves have the appropriate knowledge to guide them in this zone of proximal development, then they can be used in order to teach the younger or sometimes less able classmates. And as I've said, Vygotsky introduced this idea of the importance of the social environment. The fact that in different cultures, learning may be approached in different ways, and that this is important because it will mean that children might learn in very different ways across the world. So we've looked at uh, mainly Piagetian theory of cognitive development and also had a brief look at what Vygotsky brought to cognitive development. And now we're going to focus on one particular aspect of cognitive development, which is the development of memory. This is quite a detailed slide and I don't want you to worry too much about all of the detail, but I want you to focus on some aspects of it. So obviously the first thing we need to do if we're going to remember anything is we have to actually pay attention to it. Lots of information comes into our brains from the world, such as things that we can see and things that we can hear. But we actually have to pay attention to certain things if they are going to be transferred into working memory, which used to be called short-term memory. Now, working memory has a very limited capacity, so if we want to remember something, then it has to be transferred across into long-term memory through the process of storage, encoding and storage. And then if we want to remember that piece of information, at some point we will need to retrieve it from long-term memory back into our working memory. The thing at the bottom, called the central executive, I'm not going to talk about today, but if you did choose to come and do psychology at university, then this is very much something you would learn about when looking at uh, models of memory. But the central executive is basically something that oversees everything. So it oversees our sensory register, our working memory, and our long-term memory. Now, of course, with developmental psychology, what we're interested in is how memory develops. And one of the ways in which we get better at remembering things is we get better at using strategies. And what do I mean by that? Well, things that help you to remember things better. And one of those strategies is a strategy of rehearsal. Simply repeating information over and over can help you remember that information more effectively. And what we find is that children under the age of about seven do not spontaneously use rehearsal as a strategy at all. They simply just don't think about it. When they do start to use it at the age of about seven or eight, then they use it, but they don't use it very effectively. So if they're given a list of words to learn, they might just rehearse the first word. They don't think to rehearse all of the words. Another strategy that we can use to remember things is organisation. So again, if you think of a simple word list task where you're asked to learn a list of random words, one way to make that easier is to chunk words that belong to the same category. So for example, if it was motorbike, car and lorry were in the list, then you might chunk those together and remember that there were some vehicles. If some of the words were animals, such as bear, elephant and monkey, again, you might chunk those together because it helps you to chunk the information and organise it in that way to remember it. Again, children under the age of seven or eight do not spontaneously use this strategy at all. It doesn't occur to them to use a strategy. And when they do use it, they don't use it very effectively because they don't use very sensible categories in which to chunk the information. These two things here are just what I've been talking about. So a utilisation deficiency is when children do not use the strategy at all and a control deficiency is when they start to use it but they don't use it very effectively. So when children use strategies, they first show a utilisation deficiency in that they don't use it and later they show control deficiencies in that they don't use them very well. Another important aspect of memory is knowledge. The more you know, the more you're likely to be able to remember information that's related to that which you already know. So if you think back to Piaget's schemes, you're slotting knowledge into a pre-existing scheme which makes it easier to remember. And in most things, children have less knowledge than adults, simply because they haven't experienced as much of the world as adults. In a very nice experiment, which Chai did in 1978, he took advantage of children having more knowledge than adults on a particular subject. So in this experiment, he gave children and adults a digit span task. So if you look at the right-hand side of the graph here, you can see that when asked to remember digits, strings of digits, and try to repeat them back, that the adults are better than the children. They're showing improved memory. However, the twist in the tale here is that the children were experienced chess players and the adults had not played chess at all. 
So they were also asked to remember chess positions on a chessboard. And when asked that, the children outperformed the adults, as you can see on the left-hand side of the graph. And that is because the children's knowledge of chess enabled them to chunk the information of the pieces on the chessboard in able to more effectively remember them. So you can see that when children do have superior knowledge to adults, it helps them with their memory. Finally, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about metamemory. Now, what do we mean by metamemory? This is our understanding of our memory. So how well do I understand how many pieces of information I might remember? How well do I understand what sort of strategies it's sensible to use to try and remember something? And studies have shown that the better we understand our own memory, the better our memories tend to be. And children's metamemory tends to be less well developed than adults. At Leeds, we've been interested in a particular aspect of metamemory, which is knowing what you don't know. Now, obviously, in memory, it's very important to be able to remember that piece of information that you have encoded in your memory. But in some contexts, it's actually just as important to understand when you have not encoded a particular piece of information in your memory and you therefore do not have the knowledge to answer the question. We've gone into schools and we've run an event with children. And then the next day, we asked the children questions about the event. We haven't told them we're going to ask them questions about it because we want it to be a naturalistic memory test. But we've devised a question such that some of them are unanswerable. That is, the child has not encoded the correct piece of information into memory to be able to answer the question because that piece of information was not available in the original event. So, for example, we might ask the child what colour were the socks that the lady was wearing, but the lady was wearing boots, so they were unable to see the socks. And what we look at is if children are likely to correctly admit when they do not know the answer to a question. And in lots of studies that we've done using this sort of test, we found that older children are much more likely than younger children to admit when they do not know the answer to a question. We've also found an effect of some other variables. So, for example, the context of the interview is another very important variable that affects this tendency to admit whether or not you don't know. If children think that the adult interviewing them genuinely wants to know the answer to the question because the adult doesn't know and they are just requesting some information from the child, the child is more likely correctly to say when they do not know the answer. However, if they think it's more of a test that the adult actually already knows the answers and they're just testing the child to see if the child knows the answers, then in fact, children are less likely correctly to say when they do not know the answer to something. We've also found that the phrasing of the question affects children's tendency to say, I don't know. So, for example, thinking about the socks question, there are certain questions called yes-no questions, where you only have to say yes or no. So if we were to say to the child, were the lady's socks blue, the child only has to say yes or no to that question. A more open-ended type question would be what colour were the lady's socks, where you are not suggesting a particular response. If you ask the children what colour were the lady's socks, they're much more likely to say I don't know than if you say were the lady's socks blue. So just to recap, we've looked at three aspects of memory development. We've looked at the use of strategies, which develops with age. First, children don't use the strategies, and then when they do use them, they use them less effectively. Secondly, the importance of knowledge, which normally is a disadvantage to children, but in Chai's experiment, he showed just how important knowledge can be for memory. And then finally, the idea of meta-memory, so being aware of your own memory and being aware of what you have and haven't encoded in your memory. If you'd like to look at some further reading on this topic, there's a chapter in a book by Baddeley et al. Uh, the book is called Memory, and chapter 12 is on children's memory. And then if you'd like to have a look at a journal article, um, I've given a reference here to the work that we've done with children on their tendency to correctly indicate when they do not know the answer to a question. Thank you very much. <laughs>